everybody, welcome back, Devin, the OG, the original Grognard. Here we are sitting down. We are going to finally be playing Space Infantry Federation, newest game from Lock and Load Publishing, one of their new line of defense games. Yes, that's right. It is a new series of games that we are going to be putting out. Uh, not really covering any one specific theme, but uh, it is a series of games that follow somewhat the same uh, gameplay. Most people may know them as state of siege games, but we're calling them line of defense games. Uh, this has been recently developed by Nathan Hansen, and uh, we've done a couple unboxings. Of, well, we've done one unboxing. A couple other people have done some unboxings as well. But now we're actually going to sit down and look at gameplay. Uh, going to do this one a little bit differently. There are four boards uh, that go along with the game. And to understand how the game plays, you kind of got to understand how the boards are set up because how the boards are set up will affect how the game is played. And I'll get to that when we get to the specifics of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each board in turn and we're going to take a look at how you set this game up. Um, it is a solitaire game. You can't play it two player. It is for the solo aficionados. And uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it first. Let's go ahead and take a look. At probably the easiest board to set up. This is the event board. Every once in a while you'll get a, uh, a random event and you've got these random event chits. There's only like what, seven of them. Um, and basically when uh, you have a random event called, you will pull one of these chits. You'll take a look at it, see what the symbol is, and that will match one of the six uh, random events on the table. You just go ahead and put the marker in its associated spot, then roll a D6, and basically that's what random effect happens. And these counters will stay out there until every single one has been used at least once. So there you go. You got two military, two foreign relations, one internal politics, one economy, one technological uh, random events. Now, once you have all these placed, then you will go ahead and remove them and put them back into the available event markers and continue drawing random events. So you won't get a lot of the same random events multiple times in a game unless you end up pulling a lot, a lot, a lot of random events. But so just to set up the game, you just take the seven random event markers and just stick them in the available event counters and you set that off to the side wherever works for you most easily. All right, so the next board we're going to be taking a look at for the set of four is the politics board. And this is where you'll be tracking how the interstellar state of affairs is going on between you playing as the Earth player and the five other factions that are out there. Uh, as a quick example, what the five factions are is you have the Flesh Eaters, the Chthonians, Mercenaries, Mutants, and cyborgs those are the five different factions and unlike a normal state of siege game where you are going to be dealing with multiple problems on multiple tracks this one the alien species will react to your aggressions with aggression and not really be aggressive if you're not really aggressive to them and we'll get into that during gameplay but to set these up you set take these political markers which are just these little crosses or X's or however you want to play them. Uh, at the beginning of the game, each of the races that are adjacent to each other in the kind of this soul is in the center and all the other races are, are kind of around outside of them. <clears throat> and there are random events that can push any of these races to war with their neighbors. So for example, between the Flesh Eaters and the Chthonians, they start off as neutral, but they could end up with an alliance or they could end up going to war. But you start off with all the political markers in between. So Chthonians and Cyborgs start off as neutral. Cyborgs and Mutants start off as neutral. Mercenaries start off with... It, yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> you put them right in the middle. Now, the center track is Soul's um, stability chart. And basically, you start with your central stability off with the three. You have an expansion desire that's at a zero and fleet losses that is, starts off at a zero. Every once in a while, you get random events that will force you to your, the people of Seoul. They want to expand out into the universe. They want you to set up colonies. So if you get that event, it goes up. And as you can kind of see, it's kind of tied to your stability. If the desire goes up one more level, 
It only can go up one level. If it goes up a second level, you lose one point of stability. The game is automatically lost if, for some reason, Soul loses all its stability. Now, losses are basically lost combat losses. Whenever you lose a fight in space, it starts to go up. Now, that can go up two steps. And then by the, if you get a third loss, then that forces the stability down. So you kind of got to watch your stability as well. Now, the nice thing about, about Desire is that if you actually plant a colony and your, your expansion Desire is at one, if you plant a colony, well, it pushes it back down to zero because, well, people are happy with you that you're now expanding. <clears throat> Fleet losses, eh, it's a little bit more difficult to get those down, but there is a mechanic for that. All right, next is the war effort between soul and the other races out there. You start off at peace with the Flesh Eaters, the Chthonians, the Mutants, and the Cyborgs, but you always start off at war with the Mercenaries because, well, they're mercenaries. They're always going to take an advantage to try to invade and get as much as they can out of it. Um, now, there are, again, you're going to run into events that will push this track up and down, and whatever the the war effort level is that will determine what type of events that race is going to be able to do when you start pulling chits. Now I'll get into that in a little bit because that's the core mechanic of the game. But if you'll notice, whenever you're at peace, there's only three different events that the nations can, that the enemy nations can do to you. When you expand into Cold War, now there's a fourth one that they can do. We get to mobilize. There's a fifth one. When they get to war, there's a sixth one. And in total war, they get bonuses. So, now this will fluctuate as you do things during the game and just through random events. Sometimes you'll just have a random event that, you know, they'll they'll decide that they want to shift, you know, one one space towards Cold War with you. Doing that is good for them because then that starts unlocking more things during the activation phase. Now, you can push these back up and you can kind of slow them down with diplomacy and we'll get into that later. Uh, but this is basically where you track your war effort track. And like I said, it's really important because you can only do the effects on the activation counters by whatever their piece limit is. So if, say, for example, you were to draw a flesh eater that was a technological advancement, which is that marker right there, but they're, only, you're, they're not at Cold War or higher, they're only at peace, they wouldn't be able to do that event. If they were at Cold War and you drew it, that they would get the technological advancement, well, then they'd get the technological advancement. Um, then down here is to research technologies. This is where it's uh, Earth's technologies, uh, if you research them, will end up as a, as a reminder. And basically the core of the game, the activation queue and the activation token holder box. Now this is also sometimes known as the pool. So basically what you're going to do, and I'll show this when we get the, with, when we get the board over, when we get set back up on the full board, what exactly the pool does and what exactly the activation queue does, because this is basically the core of the game is right in here. So just remember that and uh, we'll get to that when we start playing the game. The next uh, table that we or next board that we're going to be taking a look at is probably one of the most important ones, probably after the actual uh, system board itself, the Research Resource Resource Track Locked Assets Board. Now, this one I really kind of had to sit down and explain in turn because as part of the setup, there are decisions that you have to make that will affect how the beginning of the game goes, and it kind of helps to know what you're putting where to basically understand that so basically it's it's all icon driven first off you have the research progress up here i'm not going to get into that a little too too much right now but that basically is where you do your research to get really cool new technologies now there's nine technologies i believe in the game that you can learn maybe 10 11 something like that <clears throat> so what you do is you if you can if you want to you can start off by putting all the resource tokens and these are the resource tokens in the resource pool or you can just start by filling up all the assets that are supposed to be supposed to be filled up so let's go ahead and take a look at the locked assets first because we'll start setting that up board first now the locked assets are assets that you don't have access to yet until you build colonies basically each one of these locked assets these thick border orange border ones here they are all colonies and basically when you build a colony then you unlock that get the benefits from that 
and unlock everything that's associated with it. So say, for example, if you want your first colony to be to be this one, then you will plant put that down as a colony on the planet that you're colonizing, and you'll get the rewards of two production markers, a new fleet marker, and a technology marker that goes into the resource pool, the unresearched technologies. So what basically what you do there is here is so here's the production colony marker. And that will go down on the the main board as you're playing when you plant that as a colony, and you do have the chance to eventually upgrade it, which gives it a little bit re, a little bit more buff resources. Basically, that little wrench there that you see is an extra dice or two that you get to roll to figure out how much uh, resources you're producing that turn. And the more of these colonies you get down, the more. Uh, production dice you'll get. Also, if you upgrade the colony, you'll notice it's got this little shield and sword. Let's see if I can get a good clear picture of it. Yeah, maybe not because we're too close. But that basically gives that colony an extra defense when it's being attacked by the enemies. <clears throat> and so basically all those colonies just go right in their associated You've got uh, in, you've got construction. You've got movement, which I is best way to describe it as uh, uh, fuel uh, fuel production. Then you've got research, and then there's the espionage, and then there's uh, political will. I guess well, that's what I call it, political will, because you get uh, morale and diplomacy out of it. Um, this is warp center technology. You have to research that before you get the uh before you unlock the final basically if you if you lay that as a colony you'll get the warp technology research which will then move to there and then you have to plant that to unlock this yeah so it's getting to the the, the high uber unlocked stuff for warp abilities extra fleets and extra technologies you have to plant the warp technology station first then take the warp technology station and plant it on another planet so we'll just go ahead and flip that over actually we'll keep it on this side right here and then it's basically just filling up if it is, you've got two warp markers there go ahead and put the warp markers there Go ahead and put the two additional support fleets. Now, I, I did mention that there are uh, nine technologies. Four of them are what are known as warp technologies. And you see that there's four technology markers right here. And you can tell which one are the warp technologies. Let's see if we can get this zoomed in. By this little orange icon in the upper right-hand corner. The other technology markers, the normal technology, have this shield in the upper right hand corner so if it's got a shield in the upper right hand corner it's a normal technology if it's got that little diamond uh, pattern right there it is a warp technology and that's how you can tell the two apart because the four warp technologies go right here they get unlocked when you get get the warp technology base planted um the other technologies there are five other technologies left but if you'll notice where they go on here there's only four spots so you put four of them out there randomly the fifth one goes into unresearched technologies now you don't get to flip that over and look at that yet you still don't know what that is so go ahead and place that there for the time being but the other technologies will get unlocked when you plant these other colonies that are associated with them. So again, we got two engineering there. So basically, you plant this colony, you put it on the board, and you automatically get the two engineering to go into the resource pool, which is right there. The fleet, the extra fleet, goes into unbuilt assets because it's not something you've built yet. And the technology goes into unresearched technologies so that you can spend research points to be able to try to figure out. And that's the same for pretty much every technology on the, or all these stations on the board. And as you can tell, they are kind of all coded. You know, you've got your engineering, you've got your fuel, you've got your research, you've got your diplomacy, you've got your espionage, you've got your morale. Like so. And you've got a bunch of new fleets that you can build as you start to expand you're going to need those because as you start to expand well you're going to be stepping on the toes of the other alien races and they're not going to like that they're going to start pushing back also what you have 
It, under unbuilt assets is the soul marker. This is the marker for the defense of soul. This can only be built on soul. And if you take a look at that, it has that wrench marker on it. So if you build this, it'll give you an extra dice in production. And believe me, production is all important in this game. Plus, it gives you some extra bonus combat there. And then you can eventually also upgrade it, which will give it even more bonus. But you don't have that yet. So you put that under unbuilt assets, under soul. You've also got three mine markers, and as you can see, mine markers have got the sword on it, so they give a little bit of a combat bonus, and they can be upgraded to give even more of a combat bonus, because you've noticed on the, on, the, on the normal side, they've got one sword. On the cross sword side, they give two swords. Now, that's important in combat, and we'll get to that when we get to combat, but, however, you don't have any of these yet. So, and you've only get three of them, so they go into the unbuilt assets, part of uh, the board. Now, you're going to have some markers left over, and they are going to go into the resource pool. These, this is what you are going to be pulling from and conducting your actions with. And so you, there you should have two in just about each one of them, except uh, diplomacy. No, I think diplomacy has, no, yeah, diplomacy has three because you only get one diplomatic flag when you plant the, uh, the, 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 the diplomatic will starport. Uh, but so yeah, just so, just so we could do a quick brief cap of what they are in case, now most of the icons are relatively easy to figure out. The white barrel is warp. Uh, the blue beaker or the purple beaker is research. The yellow medallion is propaganda. The green hexagon is movement or fuel. Uh, the green eyeball with the crosshairs is espionage. The purple flag is diplomacy. And the gray cogwheel is uh, construction. Now, you're going to be getting a certain number of these resources each turn, and you spend these resources to do actions on the board. We'll get to that when we, sh when, when, when we get there. Um, you do have, there are actually five more markers but at the beginning of the game, you start off with any five technologies that you want. And it suggests that you start off with one engineering, one fuel, one morale, one research, and one espionage. But you can take any combination of five that you want that's left from the resource pool. This is just what's recommended for your first couple games. And honestly, we're just going to go with that. Now, this board is almost about done being set up. One last thing you have to do, we've got this thing here that's called the resource track. Now, the resource track is important is because that is what the production queue of things that are going to be the resources that you're going to have access to in any one turn. Basically, what happens at the beginning of the game, let me grab my dice because I forgot to do that. You take five dice, five six-sided dice, and you roll them. And this is going to be what the game's starting re oh, that's horrible. resource queue is going to look like. So let's go ahead and break down our dice. One, two, three, four. Two ones, a two, a three, and a four. So basically, what you can do now is take whatever resources are in the resource pool and put them on the resource track. Now, why is this important? Because the track every turn moves down. So basically, at the beginning of every turn, that the Federation player has, you roll a number of dice equal to how many wrenches you have out, and depending on what the icon is, sometimes you get one dice per wrench, sometimes you get two dice per wrench, sometimes you get one dice minus one per wrench, but that will determine where on the production queue and the resource track they come up at. <coughs> After you do that, all the counters move down, and any counters that end up in this row automatically slide over into your stored resources and you can use anything in your stored resources. So basically, after you're done rolling, Anything in this bottom row you can use as a, a marker to do an action with each turn. So what we've got here is I rolled two ones, a two, a three, and a four. Now, putting things on the resource track is a little bit tricky, uh, but let's go over it a little bit. You see it's kind of three wide. Well, you don't start off the game having three wide resources. Basically, only one thing can occupy a space at a time. One resource can occupy, so you can only have one item in number one. So right here, we got two number ones, so I get to choose two resources to put in slot number one, but they have to be the same. So, all right, maybe I wanna go ahead and go with espionage. We'll go ahead and put two espionage in there. 
Now, later in the game, if you decide to commit your morale markers, then you can put the morale markers there and that opens up extra rows. So for example, for this turn, let's just go ahead and go through this. So I got two ones, let's see, a two, uh, let's put a diplomacy and two, three, uh, let's put research and four, let's put engineering. Okay, so that's how my, that's how the game starts off. Now, let's say we go right into my very first turn. And so what we do is say I get, I have two wrenches out there. So I get to roll 2d6 and they're going to be filling slots one and two. Okay, now this is kind of a problem because you can never put anything into a space that's already occupied, even if it is, a, let's say if I had a third espionage and with track one, I couldn't put anything, I couldn't put another espionage in there. Plus, since I haven't opened up these two tracks, I, th that's, a, that's a lost resource. Same thing with number two. As it stands now, I have a diplomacy, but since there's already a diplomacy in the first column, I can't put anything there. So that's a wasted resource as well. Now, since I've done, rolled the resources, all my production markers advance downwards, and that's where it is now. And then since I've got my stored resources down here, these are the only icons that I can activate during my turn to do actions. And so you'll see it sometimes takes a while for these to move down before they can be used. So that's why when you're rolling that setup, you, you kind of want to hoping to get high rolls so it'll get to you quicker. Plus you also, it'll also determine, all right, do, what do I want first? Do I want research? Do I want technology? What do I want? So you want to put those in the, in the higher slots. Now, what say, for example, we have this, but for some reason, I was able to unlock this re this additional column. Well, good, now that gives me another column. So say at the start of my turn, so let's say I have 3d6 this time to roll for resources. We get one, two, and five. Okay, so one is great. I've got two open slots for one. So let's go ahead and take a, a, a fuel and put it in the one slot. In the two slot, I've got espionage already filled. Ah, but I've got this open slot here now. Let's go ahead and put a production in there. And now five, we got a production here. Oh, let's make sure, let's go ahead and put a resource or a research in there. And then at the, as soon as that's done, everything is slid down. The key thing is you have to remember is the only time you can double up is when you initially roll it. It's like when I did, when I rolled the two ones for here, if for some reason, uh, I had, I, I rolled a two, well, let's see if I had, if I had rolled a two, and this column wasn't there. And I wanted to put, a, I couldn't put a research there. Even if I had, or another espionage, even if I had another espionage token, I couldn't place it there because you can't place it, even if it's a matching resource, on a space that's already filled. That's why it's kind of important. Now you're kind of hurting yourself a little bit because your propaganda, you, you're, you're, you, you've only got, you know, three propaganda tokens at the beginning of the game. So you kind of kind of got to be careful on how you're spending your resources. If you're spending them here, if you're using them for an action, if you're burning them uh, permanently and removing them in the game for a big action. So you kind of got to kind of figure out how you want to spend your resources to expand your width to go along with your columns because this is this is what determines what actions you do in your turn and the more option the more actions you have to do the more stuff you can do and the better you can be prepared to defending your home space and advancing and taking colonies yes i know that was rather long but this board is probably the most confusing of the boards to put together and it, it is very important that you understand how the resource track slides everything down so the things that you consider most important you want to put at the four five and six areas so you get them into your stored resources quicker now also remember you only have five stored resources resources so if for some reason you end up a turn like that and you don't spend anything those three are lost so you can only keep five resources from turn to turn. Although from personal experience, I've never run into that problem. I find it way too easy to spend my resources. Maybe if I start getting, you know, more of the colonies put down and have lots more resources to play with, I might run into that. But in the early game, yeah, you're struggling for resources. And that's another thing you have to look out for. It's like, what is more important to you for your first initial colonies? Is it research? Is it fuel? Is it research? Or uh, is it... Is it <laughs> 
production, fuel, research, espionage, diplomacy, and morale. I mean, it's all, that's all decisions you have to make. And to me, that's what gaming is all about, is making choices. And this game makes you make lots of choices. All right, on to the final board, the main board itself. Okay, finally, we have the main game board itself. And as compared to the last two, this one's pretty easy to set up. First of all, you have Earth in the center, the Soul System, and you start off the game with one fleet in Soul, and that will start off right there. Um, and then you will look around the borders are the enemy nations that we're going to be facing off against. Again, red are the Flesh Eaters, yellow are the Cathanians, Blue are mercenaries, white are the mutants, and green are cyborgs. Now, each one of them sets up pretty much exactly the same. Each one of them will have this little fleet bar right here, right next to them, and they'll be colored. And there, you will place the fleets. Each nation only has three fleets. You will start with the lowest on the left-hand side and then going up. And if you'll notice, all the fleets, none of them, they're not all the same. They're a little bit different. So, for example, the Flesh Eaters have a one fleet, a two, three, a two fleet, and a three fleet, whereas the Chthonians have a one, a three, and a four. The Mercenaries have a zero, a two, a three. The Mutants have a zero, two, a four. And the cyborgs have a two, three, and four. Now, you also need to pay attention. And this one thing I didn't point out is we also have this really cool new reference card, which will tell it's also got the Galactic Conflict, which, uh, which will be important if it comes up, Alliance and War Efforts, War Opportunities, and how you can spend your own resources to affect them. But it also got all the counter reference guides of all the different events that could pop up. So if you draw like this marker right here, that's a fast scout event, and then you take a look at it, and that'll determine what happens. And then, of course, you've got warp resource, research, morale. You know, it gives, it gives a breakdown of all the icons. But one thing you do need to pay attention to is what an enemy scout fleet is, an enemy raider fleet is, and what an enemy invasion fleet is. A scout fleet has one icon. A raider fleet has two icons. And an invasion fleet has three icons. Now, that's very important because there are events in the game that only cover, will only affect scout fleets, or will only affect raider fleets, or will only affect invasion fleets. So you kind of, it's a good idea to know that <laughs> one icon is raider, and if you'll take, or is a scout, and if you look, mercenaries, they don't have any invasion fleets. All they've got is one scout and two raiders, while everybody else pretty much has one scout, one raider, and one invasion. All right, so we got that. Go ahead and put all those markers in their respective places. Plus, you'll notice each race has six color-coded technologies like that so what you do is you just shuffle up the 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 technology tokens and you just place them somewhere next to each race like i have done here Cathon or uh flesh eaters Cathonians, mercs mutants and cybers now all the technology, they're not, again, not every race has the exact same technology. Some have different technologies than others, um, but you won't know that until you start playing it. And that's that's kind of what's really cool about it is you're not going to sure, you're not sure what technologies they're going to get. Um, you'll also see the 65432 track right here. If an alien race gets a technology, then you start by putting it in the highest number. If they get another technology, then it goes into the next number, and so on and so forth until they until they have all five of them. And once those technologies are out, they're pretty much good for the rest of the game, although you can use your espionage skill to try to stop that. And there are a couple different ways you can do that with espionage, but we'll get into that when we get into, into actual gameplay. Um, you're also going to need five dice. You're never going to need more than five dice. Five dice is the most you're ever going to need to roll in the game, so go ahead and get a good get five dice out for you. And the final thing that you need to do is you need to set up the activation token pool. And this is basically the heart of the game. 
Right here, these are all the action tokens, and you will draw these randomly, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but this will determine what happens when and where. Now, how you decide what game style you're doing, if you want an easy game, a medium game, or a hard game. Well, if you take a look on the activation markers, you've got in the upper right-hand corner a green mask, a yellow mask, and a red mask. And depending on what skill level you want to play, so say you want to play an easy game, you only insert the icons that have green. So I'm playing a medium game, so I'm using everything that has a yellow icon on it. If I were to play an easy game, I would not include this counter in the mix because it doesn't have a green face, but face by it. But since I'm playing a medium, which is yellow, then that gets added into the pool. And that's the activation token hold, holding box. If you want to put those there, it's recommended that you get a cup. I just happen to be using my Space Infantry Resurgence cup. Wow, why not? And you put all the markers in there. Now, since I'm playing it on easy, there are a handful of tokens that I will not be using because, as you can see, if I focus in, it's a green only. And really, that's pretty much it. <laughs> those are all green onlys um, in there. So those are not added into the cup. And that scales how difficult the game is going to be. The lower, the lower difficulty, let's get this back in focus, the lower difficulty of the game, the more Federation activation shits are in this cup. So you have a chance to do things more often than the aliens. And why is that important? Okay, so will go right over how a sequence of tur or how you set up a sequence of turn play initially and let's go ahead and take a look at the activation queue at the beginning of the game you take your cup you make it all random and then you start laying out tokens from right to left this is going to be the queue of activity for the turn. This is how you're going to do, how, this is what determines who's doing what, when, where, and how. Now you put out five of them, and then you start pulling tokens from the right-hand side. So you'd pull this one, and that is a Chthonian, uh, I can't even remember what that icon is. That is Spawn. So basically, the Chthonians will do a spawn action. Well, what you have to do is take a look at your, your war efforts board, take a look at the Chthonians. Unfortunately, they don't have a spawn action. So normally, if, if, they were, if they'd have been at mobilize, if they'd have been at level three war effort of mobilize, that's when spawn shows up. Then they would have been able to do this action. However, since they're still at peace, and it's just border friction and, and uh, probe. I think those are the two. Um, those are the only two icons they can do. This isn't one of the icons. This is a no effect. This gets put off to the side. Then what you do, slide the... It's basically the activation. If you're familiar with kind of Euro style games, this is the river. It slides down one and you replace the leftmost token with another token like that and you're going to continue cycling through these tokens any tokens that you use get set off to the side now that's all good and all but what happens when does when does the human player get to do his turn and when do all these get refreshed well let's go ahead and put that back let's say this token was the next one in line basically whenever you pull a federation token and you'll know the federation token is because it's kind of got that uh that, that sent with the double sign on it that is a federation activation basically that if you get that token that's going to end the turn so basically if you have that in the activation queue you don't need to fill the queue in anymore because as soon as the federation player is done with its turn it's done with the turn you take everything from the holding box all the counters that have been activated already put them back into the pool and then when the federation player is done you you redraw a new action queue in a new river so if we were to be playing this let's pull this next one and this would be a galactic event uh and then you roll on the galactic table again not going to get into that we do that action everything slides down 
Normally we replace the empty slot, but since we know that the, there's a Federation marker there and the Terran ends, there's no sense filling it in. The next one, this would be the Chthonians because it's got the Chthonian symbol in the other left-hand corner and that's border tension. And border tension is one of the war effects that you can do at peace. So you would do that event, discard it, slide the river down, then you'd pull this. This is another random type event that's uh, scout fleets. That's all fleets who have got scout fleets out there can activate. So any scout fleets that have been spawned or deployed, you go ahead and do that. But then all of a sudden, all right, bam, there's the Federation marker. You would step in the Federation turn. I'm not gonna get into the exact procedure on that. We'll do that during the gameplay video. Um, but then this would end the turn. As soon as, as soon as the turn is ended, as soon as the Federation player, you, like you're the Federation player, is finished with that action, all these markers go back into the cup, you shake them up, and then you start a new river and start a new turn. So sometimes you're going to end up with what has happened with me is like one of the first times I played it. Oh, come on, let's get back to let's get back to normal. One of the first times I played it, like the first three turns. I had, you know, a Federation token, Federation token, Federation token. So I was able to go through three turns relatively easy. Of course, I was playing on green and I had many more <laughs> Federation tokens in there. So I was kind of able to get a, get a little bit of a head jump on everything. But there have been other times where I've gone through the activation queue. You know, I've gone through 10 or 11 markers before Federation uh marker shows up and i get to take my turn and then we then we reset reset the turn all over again that's one of the cool things that makes this game so replayable is because no turn is ever going to be the same because you've got these huge amount of randomized pulled chits that conduct the activations so there there you go that's why i kind of wanted to do this setup video first because the resource track Rolling the resources is really important and you got to make sure that the more important resources you always want to be in the higher numbers because they will reach your stored resources quicker. Plus you get to choose whatever markers you want there. And just explaining the activation queue. Now, how do you win? <laughs> Probably should point that out. How do you win? There are six colonies out on the board. If you have a colony on all six of those planets, you win the game. How do you lose? If for any reason an enemy fleet is all by itself in the soul system at the end of the turn, Earth has been invaded and you lose. The other way you can lose is if you'll remember, I did mention under the stability track, if for some reason the stability falls to zero, then you're ousted from office and you lose the game anyways. So those are the two ways to lose and the one way to win. So that is the setup and a brief rundown of kind of how things work. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into recording since we've gone pretty long in the tooth on this one. Uh, a gameplay video separate from this, but yeah, we'll just we'll just this is just going to be for the for the setup video and the next video I'll work on is gameplay and we should be getting to that really soon. <gasps> Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section below. I'll see you a bit later. See ya.